Lord, thank you, as always, for your word, for your message, for your son. Lord, we are so blessed to have the freedom to come to study your word, to try to understand your message to us, how it pertains to our life, even though it was written so many years ago. Thank you again for who you are and what you do for us. And thank you for Debbie being back with us in Al's recovery. In your son's name I pray. Amen. 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 So we talked, uh, and I'm going to review eight, uh, 1, 18, and um, 19, because I think Karen had left. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit with Cephas, and I stayed with him for 15 days, but did not see any other apostle except for James, the brother of, <coughs> the Lord's brother. And we talked a little bit about how they counted things in any part of one uh, day or week or year was considered one, so it wasn't like we would say three years was three full years, it could have been one full year and part of two uh, before and after, so it's somewhat the, the ones that like to try to figure out exactly when he was there and correlate it with Acts find it hard because of the way that they looked at the numbers. Again showing that basically he got the message for Christ, he didn't go immediately to the apostles in Jerusalem, wasn't, wasn't uh, in some kind of missionary or uh, pastor training program, you know, he was independent of them. And when he went, he did not go because he was summoned, he, he went and to visit with uh, Cephas, Peter, uh, and James. James had the, uh, was Mary's and Joseph's uh, natural son, and we talked about the fact that they had six, he had six siblings. Uh, if you want to look it up, it's in Mark and Matthew, Mark 6.3 and Matthew 13.55. James and his siblings had not been involved very much in Jesus' early ministry, but it had become important in the church. And when he was a, a leader, uh, some thought that he kind of filled the vacuum when Peter and some other apostles were had to leave Jerusalem. And uh, he was mentioned you know, and by people like jo Josephus and was martyred in uh, AD 62, caused quite a bit of this because of that. But again, basically, <clears throat> Paul is pointing out that you know, his, his mission, his go the gospel he received was independent of any human person. Okay. Judy, 20, please. 120. I assure you before God that what I am writing you is no lie. Yeah. Now regard the things I'm writing to you, look, before God I swear that I am not lying. What is this? What is what is this? What would we call this sentence? What do we call this sentence? Yeah. Oh. What, what, what we, if somebody said is it this. A promise or? That's oath. A promise or an oath, yeah. He's swearing an oath to God that what he's saying is true. Yeah. You know, what do we do when we go to court? We, I swear to, mm -hmm. that what I'm saying is true. He's making an oath that what he's saying is true. That's pretty strong. Yeah. And so he's obviously, as we go with on this letter, upset that some people are saying that he's not truthful, so he's making it very clear that this is, what he's saying is true. You know, he, he's you know, swearing an oath to God that what he has said and will say is true. So when somebody does that, what do you think about what they're talking about? Yes, they're believable. Yeah, most of the time. But you, you look at your history of them. You know somebody 
has a history of lying. We know some people like that. If they swear something like that, you're, you're probably not going to believe them. But if you know them and the people that collect, where he was sending this letter to knew him, his truthfulness and his way he behaved, they would then more likely accept what he says is true, because the way he's saying it. This is a solemn oath, the way he is, is phrased. Jim, 21, please. Later I went to Syria and Cilicia. And so he's, and will continue to, you know, direct what he's doing in this letter as a message about his particular interest. So he says in the phrase, he went to Syria and Cilicia, where he spent a long time uh, setting up churches and being a missionary. So how much does he say about what he did there? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> He's, you know, if we're right, looking at a historical document, we want, you know, Paul did three years here and did, you know, all these years here, and this is what, where he went, this is what he did. He's just interested in dealing with the issue the letter's about. So that's why we always have to look at the letters, why they were written, and, and what the point is. Because he says almost nothing about, other than he went there, what he was doing there. Um, it does say something, though, in, in uh, 23, yeah. what, he, what, he, right. what he was saying, which was his testimony. So, Charmaine, 22? I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. What do you think that means? What do you think that means? What, was Paul as Saul unknown to the churches in, in Jerusalem? What had he done before he was converted on the road to Damascus? He, so, do you think they knew who he was? So, what do you think this phrase really is what he's trying to say here? <coughs> Maybe they didn't know him as Paul, but they knew him as Saul. That's yeah. probably part of it, but what else? What other. <coughs> they hadn't seen me for three years. No. He's, it, pro, they think it, what he's really saying is they hadn't seen him. He hadn't been in Jerusalem. They obviously, from the next sentence, knew who he was as Saul. But he's basically again outlining he had not been there, had not gotten it, his message from anybody in, in Jerusalem. So he's outlining that. Lance? Uh, 23, please. 23. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And so th this, out this says what he was doing. And so they had not might not have seen him, but they had heard about him. They knew what was going on. Would that be a surprise? Do we find that very often that somebody was doing something against the group and all of a sudden was supporting them? Do you see that very often? Yeah. No. <laughs> Not the way he was persecuting them. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it, it would take, to me, a God doing it. You know, If we're all really bigoted or persecuting a group, it's, I have almost never seen anybody turn that around. Um, some of us that have been ambivalent over the years have gotten a better understanding of our behavior. Uh, some of our biases that we kind of grew up with, and, and when we, and that, but we, but if we're really hard in that, it seems to be would be very difficult to change that. If you were started off kind of you know. Some of our, well, they say institutional biases about people in different groups. Sometimes you can learn something different, but if you are absolutely persecuting that group, it would be, to me, almost impossible to change. And it would take something like God to do that. 
So wouldn't that be a surprise? That somebody that was so actively persecuting them was now preaching the gospel? They would have been, yeah, my, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> There must have been a lot of curiosity and doubt. Well, I don't think there'd be a lot of doubt. If somebody had yes. gone so far as help, you know, kill one of the early apostles, if he came up to me and said, I've changed my ways, how would you... I would it say, would no, I'm not really <laughs> sure about that. <laughs> what are you trying to set me up for? <laughs> you know, or... Are you trying to get me in trouble and so you can deal with me like you did with my friend? Uh, Maybe they thought he was changing his method mm -hmm. and reeling them in. Right. Do we see that? Yeah. Of course we see that. I mean, if you watch any uh, the shows about the police and, and uh, courts and things like that, sometimes they, that's exactly what they do. Trap you. <laughs> Okay, 24, Joy. And he praised God because of me. Yeah. So it's got to be God <laughs> that changed him, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it would take more than a, to me than a human mm -hmm. ability to, to change somebody like that. So they were correct in saying, praising God for this. Because... Was Paul a great missionary? Yes. Very much so. Very much so. Ultimately, whose version of the gospel, if you can say it as versions, you might say one, one out. You know, what he's going to be dealing with is the ones that they called Judaizers that wanted Christians to be circumcised and follow a lot of the Jewish uh, laws that dealt with food and other things. Do we do that? No. Do we follow those? No. You know, so a lot of American men are circumcised, but it's not for religious purposes. Mm -hmm. um, and so his, Paul's vision, Paul's gospel, his understanding of the gospel is the one that we follow. And so obviously he, he and others that followed him had, in my view, the right gospel. Okay. Let's see. I think it's... Let's see. Did you read the last one, Debbie? No, I'll read it. <clears throat> Two, one? Yeah. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus um, along also. Okay, so what does he say about what he's been doing for 14 years? <laughs> again, he's very selective. He realized that also Luke and Acts was very selective. Because what do we hear about Titus and Acts? This is GT class. <laughs> what do we hear about Titus in Acts? What does what does Luke say about Titus in Acts? Absolutely nothing. He's not mentioned at all. And obviously, <clears throat> Titus was an important person with Paul and helping him. Who did those of you that with me for First and Second Corinthians? Who did Paul send to the church at Corinth to check on them and make sure everything was all right? Timothy. And Titus. Oh, yeah. He sent Timothy and Titus. And he, he mentions Titus in a number of his letters. Oops, I got to my page. Second Corinthians. Second Timothy is mentioned, and he also wrote Titus and Titus. <laughs> and so Titus was an important helper for Paul. And so you, it makes you start thinking about how both of those books, the ones, the Galatians he's writing now, 
and acts and what were their purposes, you know, and because sometimes some of the this Bible historians try to tease you know, out that is there any uh, things that incorrect about the timeline that Luke writes out, the timeline that, that Paul writes out. You got to realize they had different interests. Um, Luke was interested and wrote his book after the, the Jewish Revolution, 20 plus years after this letter was written. And his interest was trying to make the Gentile Christians be certain and comfortable with what was going on and didn't often put a lot of the early ambiguity in, in the Acts. He, also, he wasn't there. He did join up later on. And the people, Peter, Paul, James, were all gone by then when he was writing the letter, so he couldn't back, go back and fact check. Um, and so, don't, sometimes don't get too upset if they don't quite match up. Fourteen years. Again, the historians try to deal with this, but fourteen years from when? Normally, if I'm saying, I've been living in Hilo since, I would say since this date, then you could say, I've been living here that long. So usually when we say something like that, we have some kind of starting point to know when that, board, that time was started. Does he put a starting point here? No. <laughs> no. And so, what are the, the two likely 14 years starting points? When he became Paul. When he became Paul, that's one of them. That's probably the one that they think the most likely. When he became Paul. He's timing it from when he had the experience with Christ. What would be the other one? After 14 years. After 14 years from what? Lance? Christ's death? <laughs> no. Uh, probably not. <laughs> it might be from when he was there the first time. Yeah. And so this, he's talk, starting to talk about his second mm -hmm. visit. So the other option would have been 14 years after he was, you know, he, after he went and visited with Peter and James. Mm -hmm. And so, <clears throat> the, the ones that want to make, you know, a nice timeline, this drives them crazy. Because a lot of people think what you did, he's timing it from when he has experience with Christ. You can't really match them up quite as well, because Luke also doesn't put years. And so, you know, it, it, <laughs> It drives those people a little crazy. Does it really matter? No. No. <laughs> it really doesn't matter. <laughs> and again, he doesn't really say much because his interest is not saying, I, you know, for two years I was in this city, for three years I was over here, and I went back over here. He, he's just saying that he's basically showing that he was not there for that period of time. And his interest is dealing with the fact that the his rivals were saying, probably saying things that he was, you know, a uh, underling of the Jerusalem church and he should be following what they're teaching, what they were teaching, and what, they're con what this group was teaching, and his gospel was, was wrong, it was incomplete. And so, but, so he's not interested in, in telling people like we might be interested in, what do you do all that time? <laughs> he's not interested in, he's getting right to where he, what he wants to deal with. He, well, he says the last place he went to was Syria and Sicilia, mm -hmm. and then after that, 14 years. So the last place, 14 years before that was when he went to Sicilia and Syria. I'm going to pass this around. <laughs> Uh, basically, you know, this is a flip chart showing what it was called then, and remember, we were talking Galatia, but actually Galatia 
went all the way down here. And this is what the countries are now and some of the names. And so, the, in the lower part of Galatia, and, and remember he actually came from that area, that was Taurus too. Uh, the, <clears throat> there's a lot of cities and there's a lot of early missionary work. Antioch was there. Uh, and so he spent, you know, those 14 years in that area. We're on 2-1. Uh, <laughs> okay. So he's taking Titus. What do we know about Titus? You know, he wasn't mentioned in Acts, but what do we know about Titus? <laughs> Who was Titus? He was somebody who he could trust. He was somebody who was trust. But he was a Gentile convert. He was not a Jewish convert. He was a you know, they were all, the, all the Gentiles would be considered Greek, but he was a Gentile convert. He was not a Jewish convert. Timothy was, remember, and, and so, remember, Paul actually circumcised Timothy because Timothy was, mother was Jewish, and so under the Jewish traditions, he would be considered Jewish, and so, but Titus was not, and so that's why it's going to be important as we go on. Okay, where was I? I think it's Dennis, two, three, five. <coughs> two? Yeah, two, two. <clears throat> I went in response to a revelation and set before them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles, but I did not, I did this privately to those who seemed to be leaders for fear that I was running or had run a race in vain. Oh, wow. What's he saying here? He says a lot in this one sentence. So who got him to go to Jerusalem after these 14 years? And who did not make him go there? So he had a revelation. Does he say exactly how that, what that entailed? No. Was it, you know, no, he doesn't. You know, he said he had a revelation. It might have been a personal one. It might have been to the group he was with. It, again, it didn't really matter. What's important is where did the command, where did the end of the, uh, you know, spirit cause him to go to Jerusalem? Who sent him? Who did not do? If God sent him, who did not send him? The disciples. The disciples. He was not called by the disciples to Jerusalem. He's again showing that he had an independent gospel, the same gospel, but it was independently given to him by Christ. He was not. It was not given to him. He was not beholden to the to the to the disciples, the apostles in Jerusalem. He was not called there. You know, like, oh, this guy, is he really giving the right message? We better reel him in and find out what's going on with him. He's saying that's not what happened. And I went again to meet with these people. And, and so it again shows if they were, if his rivals are arguing that he got the, the message from the disciples, the apostles in Jerusalem, that they they were that was not right. You know, he's again pointing out his independence of the message. Why would Paul? Or why would God want Paul to go? to Jerusalem. He wanted uh, Paul to preach among the Gentiles. I'm sorry, say that again? He wanted him to preach among the Gentiles. Yeah, but why would, what was Paul's motivation 
be to go to Jerusalem at this point. To reassure those leaders that were trying to... Yeah, to reassure the leaders that he had a message. And also, most likely wanted them to rule that his message to the Gentiles was okay. What? And that would lead him to be able to say to anybody that was fussing about his message that I got the approval from the big guys. I got the <laughs> approval from the you know the main people, the people that really knew Christ. Would that make my standing a little better? Of course it would. You know. And so one of his motivations would be to make sure that, you know, reading between the lines, this was a very uh, early time in the church. We, we didn't have what we call the synoptic gospels written yet. And this might be the first letter of the New Testament. This letter to the Galatians is sometimes spelled to be Paul's first letter. Luke had not written Acts. You know, Hebrews had not been written. All the other letters had not been written. And so there's, a, you know, you might, a bit of ambiguity about exactly what the message might have been. Obviously, Paul and the, the apostles had a message that directly from Christ. But some other people might not have had that. And so there's trying to figure out exactly what the message is, some people. So these, his rivals probably were not doing it in a bad way. They were doing what they thought was right. And so Paul wanted, you might say, to confer with the leaders in the Jerusalem church and make sure that they're all, as we would say, on the same page. That we're all, you know, saying the same thing. And this would make his position all that much stronger. So that's why he says, the latter part, I was running or had run for, for nothing. And so he obviously a little, was a little concerned that he would not get that approval. Because that would mean that all he had been done would have been in vain. Okay, uh, let's see, three please. Okay. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. And so this, he, get, he had taken Titus, you know. And he, he might have done that on God's prompting, he might have done it on his own. As we talked a little bit earlier, Titus was a Greek convert. He was then not circumcised. The Greeks really felt that, the, uh, uh, you might say, a body purity, any, any deformity of the body for the Greeks was considered a terrible, sinful thing to do. And, um, and so, <clears throat> and remember that especially the men, would get together in, in their gymnasiums where they exercised and they did it in the nude. And so you could easily tell if somebody had been circumcised or not because you could just see. The Jews that wanted to be considered Greek actually went to a surgery to reverse, to reverse the circumcision. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, when the, they had the Maccabean Revolution against the Celsus, it's, you know, about 130 years earlier, the Jews went around and killed off all those because they could look and see, you know, they, you know they, one of the things, you know, the reason there's so much persecution going on, and some of the reasons why the, the Galatians were being, had some pressure by the Judaizers is there was actually persecution about against Jews that the that the Zealot Jews felt were not Jewish enough. 
you know. And so they actually, initially in their revolt against Rome, they killed off all the ones that they thought were not Jewish enough. They had a special knife, a very thin knife, and they snuck up behind people and stabbed them in the back. <laughs> and uh, do we sometimes see that even now? In the, when there's a kind of a nationalistic or religious, some people want to be purist. Muslims. Muslims. Yeah, what's going on in the Muslim world at this time? Who are they killing more than anybody else? Yeah. Their own people. And because uh, they don't feel that they're Muslim enough. And so, yes. <laughs> it's, like that so. woman that didn't wear her head covering. Yeah. Right, recently. exactly. Yeah. Or didn't wear it the right way. Or something, yeah. How yeah. she? did it. They killed her for it. And now they're killing people who were protesting about it. So Titus, as was mentioned, was not mentioned at all in Acts because Luke's interest was different. He didn't want to show some of the early ambiguity about what he needed to do to be Christian. So he doesn't mention Titus at all in Acts. And Titus clearly was a Greek convert. And <clears throat> Paul took him, maybe because Titus was very helpful, but it might have been because he would be a test case, because he would not have been circumcised. And the question is, do you need to be circumcised as a male? Do you need to follow the Jewish dietary laws to be a Christian? This would be a, a test case. So what happens? What, what happened to Titus? Was he circumcised? Yes. He was depression. What? It was pressure to be circumcised. Yeah. So we did. There was pressure to get him circumcised. Okay, go on with, with four, Judy. This matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. Whoa. And go on with five, please. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might remain with you. Oh. <laughs> so we have a problem here. The problem doesn't show quite as clearly in the way that they translated uh, it in our book. Uh, but basically, Paul is quite agitated. And from 2.4 to 2.10 is actually one long, complex sentence in the Greek. And it's part of sentences, and the syntax is not always following. And so this is why people really think he wrote this letter himself, because the scribe would have probably straightened out, as we would say, the, the English, the, in this case the Greek. And so from 2.4 to 2.10 is actually one long, complex sentence, and parts of you know sentence stuck together. He was obviously quite agitated when he was writing this. And so this is why the people think he actually wrote this by himself and wrote it as a rough draft and sent it out <laughs> in a hurried hurry, because it, in some ways the Greek is very difficult to follow. But basically he's saying, the issue came up <clears throat> on account of the false brothers who were snuggled in, who slipped in to spy out the freedom we enjoy in Jesus Christ in order they might enslave us. Now he doesn't really say who these false brothers were, but <clears throat> if, if they were thinking that they were Christian and I called Jim a false brother, false Christian, how would that go? 
<laughs> that's, that's, that's pretty much an insult, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And so he's, he's laying it out to these guys already. Jim would forgive you. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. <laughs> so he didn't know who they were, right? These spies. Sounds oh, like I'm sure he knew who they were. Oh, he knew who yeah, they were. Remember, all in, in our study of the, the, in this letter to Corinthians, he didn't ever name his rivals. Yeah. Partly not to give him any respect. If I say Sylvia's the one that's, you know, we're arguing with, I, that lives, gives her more respect than, and I say, that woman. <laughs> 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 yeah. And so, he doesn't name them. I'm sure he knew who they were. And so it makes you know, us now try to figure out, well, who are these people? You know, some of the, the people that write about this think that these were some Pharisees that actually became Christian. And, and remember, they were very strong in following the <clears throat> Jewish tra traditions, and it hadn't been, and it wouldn't be for quite a while to think of Christianity as a separate religion. It was felt to be a sect at this time of the Jewish religion. There was other sects, the Essenes and others at this time that, that were in, felt to be in the <clears throat> family of the Jewish faith. Part of it was political, because the way the Romans looked at things, if you had a religion that had been around for a while, they felt it was acceptable. They felt that all the, they kind of commingled all their different gods. I remember Paul talking about when he was in, uh, in Athens about they had all these statues of all the gods, including one that had no name. And so, the Jews, because <clears throat> they had a long-standing religion, were giving a pass, because generally you were supposed to, to worship all of them, and particularly worship the emperor, Caesar, uh, was considered a god. But the Jews were giving a pass. But if you tried to bring out a new religion, they were very, very harsh on that. They suppressed that. And so that's one of the reasons when Christianity seemed to be becoming an independent religion that they were persecuted by the Romans because they tried to stomp out any new religious movements. Was this book written before the Council of Jerusalem? Uh, no, he'll mention it later on. Okay. And so it's, it, that's why they tried to figure out when it was. So it's, it, it's felt that this was written shortly thereafter. And part of the problem in life, Paul is so agitated about that, that they had that council. And the council, is, what happened at the council is they agreed that Paul's message to the Gentiles was correct. And that Paul would be the missionary to the Gentiles and Peter and others would be the missionaries to the Jews. And then what happened? The Judaizers showed up. And so, Paul would have thought that this issue was dead and buried, and all of a sudden it's cropping up again. So if that happens, how do you feel about something like this? Confused. Well, I think oh. that there's a different word that I would use besides confused. Pissed. <laughs> Rightly. He was angry. He felt that this had been already dealt with, dealt with by the higher ups, and now these other people are coming and and saying he was wrong, and you know this is what you needed to do. And so, what is he saying that they wanted to do to to them? What were they going to take away, and what were they going to do to to them slaves? Enslave them. Enslave them in what way? Crushing their belief, their freedom to preach. Yeah, their, and their freedom from all the Jewish. Dietary and that their relationship with God was based on what they did rather than what they believed. Right, okay. exactly. So the justification was faith, not justification by doing something, some works. And so Paul is, and we still believe that our 
justification. Our salvation is based on our faith. We do good works after that, but it's not our works that gives us our salvation. And so, the Jews, if you really look at it, following the circumcision, following their dietary laws is what got them saved. And, and so the freedom is that he's talking about is the freedom of not having to do that. The freedom that we have justification and salvation by our faith and we're not enslaved by all these rules. So he was, as my wife said, was pissed uh, <laughs> that this had come up again and so he's writing this letter. This section is obviously, he was quite agitated while he was writing it because in the Greek it's a terrible sentence. Somebody else writing it for him would have probably, you know, <coughs> done a, a, a wordsmithing and corrected the syntax and made it into several sentences rather than having this one long run on sentence that's sometimes in the Greek very hard to figure out what he's trying to say. They, the translators have done the best they can. Okay, I lost track. I think it's Charmaine Fye, please. Six, five, six. Yeah, five, please. We did not give in to death for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And so he, the best we can understand, and, and he never makes it perfectly clear. Titus was pressured to be circumcised, but the best we can tell from the sentence is he was not circumcised. He was, they wanted him to be circumcised, but he ended up not being circumcised. Okay. Sylvia, six weeks? As for those who seemed to be important, whatever they were, make, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not judge by external appearances. Those men added nothing to my message. Oh. Mm -hmm. Who is he talking about? <laughs> Those who are opposing him? I don't think so. Who is he talking about? The spies. The Judaizers. Those who had a reputation of being somebodies. They had a reputation of being somebodies. Must be there. What? Pharisees and this. Must Pharisees? No. Who else? If it wasn't the Pharisees and it wasn't the Judaizers, the scribes. The scribes? Okay, you can found one I didn't think of. Who else would he be talking about? He's talking the about the apostles. Oh. They had, oh, really? So he. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> that's the best that they can come out with because it's, it's still not 100% clear in the, in the Greek. He's talking, he'd been talking about men of repute men of important status, some people are somebodies. And, and best they can figure out, he's actually now talk, still talking about James and Peter and the other apostles. But what is he saying about them? God does not make just because they're somebodies, they're not more important than anybody. <laughs> so, again, it's, a, it's difficult here. Seven, please, next. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, a, just as Peter had been to the Jews. Okay, so, wow. <clears throat> So this makes this very difficult. What is he really trying to say? You know, first, the first, the previous last sentence seems to be putting down the apostles, and then now he says, what did they say about them? And that he was entrusted with the good news to the uncircumcised. And as Peter was entrusted with good news to the circumcised, he's using circumcision and uncircumcised to this in his groups of people. And so that's why in some of the translations put it as Gentiles and Jews. Mm -hmm. And so he's saying 
initially, um, these guys, somebody's around now, they're not really all that important. And the, but then the next sentence, he says they gave, you know, gave him the authority to to preach to the uncircumcised, okay. <clears throat> the Gentiles. And so that's why this commission of us, he's obviously quite upset. So, Okay, so that got me completely lost. Who's supposed to read next? Jo Joy. 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 Yes. Think, please. Yes. For God, who was at work in the ministry of Peter as an apostle to the Jews, was also at work in my ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles. So, where did their message come from? Where did Peter's and Paul's message come from? From God. It came from God. The same message. The same message came from God. So he's making it quite clear that there's no separate message. There's not a different message. There's one message given to the Jews, one message given to the Gentiles. It was one message given by God to everybody. You know, it can't be any stronger than that. It wasn't a separate Christian app way of living for the Jews, and it wasn't a separate Christian way of living for the Gentiles. It was one message. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What would have happened, do you think, if that was not true? Absolute confusion. <laughs> Absolute confusion. <laughs> It would have been absolute confusion, I think, is a good way to say it. It would have been, it would have been to me, almost completely dis leading to a destruction of destruction. the Jewish, I mean, of the Jesus movement, our Christianity. You know, if there was two separate messages, it would lead to rivals and, and confusion about what it would mean. It would just have been, to me, very, very destructive. and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the light hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. <coughs> they agreed that we should go out to the Gentiles and they to the uh, circumcised. Okay, so he finally kind of comes to the point <coughs> that Jacob, Jacob is James. James is the Greek version of Jacob. And Cephas is Peter. And John. <coughs> no, not John that wrote John and others. It was the other John. I think. But they're not kind of, nobody can be so sure. But these were the three main pillars of the early Christian Jewish church. James, Peter, and John. And so what did they do to Paul? They blessed his ministry. Yeah. So that's usually what you mean. If you shake hands, that means you, you agreed on something. And, you know, back then and even now, you know, if, if Dennis and I are arranging some kind of deal, contract, how do we, how do we solemnize it? We, it's tied to signing a contract, you shake hands on it. And so if we're planning, that means we're in agreement. So this was a, a fairly formal approval of the division of labor. And, and Paul would be the <coughs> the missionary to the uncircumcised, the Gentiles, and Peter would be, and then would be to the Jews. Now, was it this knowing Acts? But was this? Absolutely, the case that happened. Did did Paul only preach to the G Gentiles, and did Peter and others only preach to the Jews? No. No. 
you know, is whoever you know, came. <laughs> yeah, and so what? What does this mean that they really didn't have an agreement? I don't think so. Yeah. You know, I think what it really is showing is their interest, their their focus was on this these groups. But remember what Paul would do is he would go to a city and talk in the synagogue first. And so he would preach to the Jews and some of them would follow him. He mostly would preach what we call the God-fearers, which were the Gentiles that had not become circumcised but were attracted to the Jewish religion. And most of his converts were those people. Peter but in Acts also converted some Gentiles. And so, but their interest, their focus, you know, they didn't say, you can't, in a city, have somebody come up to you that's Jewish and wanted to know about Christ, Paul would not turn them away. But his focus was not on them. And so, you know, the fact that in Acts shows that they did something different, to me doesn't, show that there was not agreement here with, with them, that Paul's focus would be on that, that means he went and sometimes converted a Jew, and likewise the other way around. Okay, let's finish up with 10, please. <coughs> all, all they asked was that we should continue to remember the Torah, the very thing that I was eager to do. Hmm. So all they asked to continue to remember the poor. Who are the poor? Uneducated. Uneducated. Homeless. Who, who, is, who is the poor? The widows and the orphans. Charmaine, does your commentator say something? <laughs> it says um, the apostles were referring to the poor of Jerusalem. While many Gentile converts were financially comfortable, the Jerusalem church had suffered from the effects of a severe famine in Palestine and was struggling. So of his journeys, Paul had gathered funds of, for the Jewish Christians. Yeah, so there's some ambiguity. Most people feel that they're referring to the poor in Jerusalem. We were at the, at the time of Christ's death, there's a lot of people there for the Passover that came from elsewhere. And remember the early parts of Acts, they stayed there and preached, but they had no support, so they been, were selling what they had to, to be supported, so they had no support. And so many people feel like what was written, that he, they're referring specifically to the poor, Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, because Peter would make, I'm sorry, Paul would make a big deal about making a collection for them. You know, he talked about that in some of his other letters. We talked about when we were studying the Corinthians letter. They also had a famine there that was known from other historical writers, and so they didn't have the ability to move food stuff around like we can deal with some area that did, couldn't supply, so there's a, a lot of poverty there. Was this a new imposition? Was this something that would have been new to uh, a Jew or a, Christ, a Christian who was following a lot of the Jewish thoughts? What were, what were the Jewish people instructed to do by God in regards to the poor? Help to take care help of them. Yeah, to take care of the widows and the orphans. Right. It was, it was a major part of their covenant obedience. It's mentioned in Deuteronomy 15 11, 24 10 to 12. I won't make you read it. It was, a, it, it was an important part of their obedience to the covenant to take care of the poor. And that was not the case of the Greeks or the Romans. They basically said, You're on your own. You know, there was really no safety net for them. And so, you know, if you really became poor, often what you did is sold yourself as a slave. And, uh, and so
so there was no safety net. The Jews, and then the, from that the Christians, felt it was very important. So that was not a big imposition on Paul. That was something he was, who had been already thinking that he needed to do, should be doing. And so that would be not a big imposition. Okay, who read last? Dennis. Dennis, so you get to close this with prayer. Ready? <laughs> yes. Oh, Father, thank you for this time to hear your word for our Sunday school. I pray for a healthier, safer week. Thank you for all your blessings in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Amen.